Let's join together in the prayer of illumination. Jesus, you welcome us as we are, as we come to you today, however that may be, whether we have slept well and rested easy or whether we are full of distress and turmoil, anything in between, you welcome us to this fellowship, to your table, to be with you, to join with you. We're here to listen to you. We're here to be found by you. We entrust ourselves to you, to the word that you have for us today. May it find hearts that are ready for it, hearts that you have prepared. We depend on you for everything, for everything. We depend on you. Amen. The scripture for today is Mark 7, verses 14 to 23. And he called the people to him again and said to them, Hear me, all of you, and understand, there is nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him. But the things that come out of a person are what defile him. And when he had entered the house and left the people, his disciples asked him about the parable, and he said to them, Then are you also without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile him, since it enters not his heart, but his stomach, and is expelled? Thus he declared all foods clean. And he said, What comes out of a person is what defiles him. For, for from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. This is the word of the Lord. Praise be to Christ. When on study leave a few weeks ago, they were watching my sermon, they said, every time I took a, a drink, every one of you that had a cup also took a drink. Like it was a sign <laughs> that we should stay hydrated and caffeinated. I have no idea if that's true, but it made me want to always bring water or coffee with me into the pulpit. This is a really intense chapter. I don't know if you've read the Gospel of Mark before. Um, the section that Mandy read for us is coming after um, a really tense, filled moment. And then the section after that is, in my opinion, one of the most interesting interactions Jesus has in all of the Gospels. And we'll, and we'll talk about both of those things. I'm not teasing you. I'm not going to just preach on the middle section and just be like, you should read these in your spare time, which you should, but I'm going to talk about it. So Jesus tells this parable. It doesn't sound like a parable to me, but Mark calls it a parable, and he knows better than me, um, to explain the interaction that he just had with the Pharisees and the scribes. But let me set the stage a little bit. Mark is ever increasing the temperature of this message. There is no neutrality in the face of Jesus. You're either following him or you're opposed to him. And those who accidentally oppose him, like the disciples, they immediately are restored, often over and over and over. But there is no neutrality. If he's God, then he must be worshipped. If he's true, then he must be listened to. If he's good, then there is no other way to receive cleansing for the defilement, and there's no other way to live a life of life but by following him. We see this throughout uh, Mark. Demons are very clear about who Jesus is. Sickness flees from him. Chaos is calmed. And wherever you are in faith, you're considering faith. You do not have faith in Jesus, which means your faith is in yourself. You're learning, you're, you're, you're beginning to practice some religion, or you're following Jesus, it's good to remember that there is not neutrality with him. Some of you might be going the other way. 
You might have learned lots of things growing up, but now you're like, I'm not sure about some of that. And that's actually part of the life of faith. Very hip to talk about people deconstructing. I think we should be constantly constructing and deconstructing. The list of things I'm confident about standing before you at 46 is way longer than when I was 29 and knew everything. I did. It wasn't a joke. I'm just kidding. It was a joke. But the things I'm confident in give me such hope and peace. I hope that they do with you also. The parable that Jesus tells the disciples is to explain in part this interaction. If you have your Bible, I'm going, to re- I'm going to backtrack a little bit and read about this interaction. And you will notice that it starts kind of like a pedestrian interaction. Like we're just talking in the hallway and then Jesus dials it up. podcast that I listened to calls uh, one of the categories when they're talking about a movie, the Vincent Hanna Award from the character that Al Pacino plays in Heat for overacting, for dialing it up to 11. And they don't mean bad acting, they just mean he's going for it. Mark Ruffalo wins in Spotlight for his screaming. This starts as a regular interaction and Jesus just jacks the volume up. Now, when the Pharisees gathered to him some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem, they saw that some of his disciples ate with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands properly, holding to the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other traditions that they observe, such as the washing of cups and pots and copper vessels and dining couches. You're thinking, hmm, that's interesting. And he said to them, well, did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites? As it is written, the people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Well, just thought we were talking about hand washing procedure here. You leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men. And he said to them, you have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your tradition. For Moses said, honor your father and mother, and whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. And they're like, we were talking about cups. But you say, if a man tells his father or his mother, whatever you would have gained from me is Corbin that is given to God, then you no longer permit him to do anything for his father or mother, thus making void the word of God by your traditions that you have handed down. And many such things you do. Anybody ever called you a hypocrite? How'd that go for you? And then Jesus dials it up. The Isaiah 35 that he's quoting might have been what the Pharisees and the scribes were concerned Jesus was doing, leading people astray. But the tone of verses 1 through 5 is like, but let's go and listen to him. And then Jesus just... And then he does this wild zag, right? They're zigging. Let's talk about cups and dining couches and hands. And Jesus is like, what about the fifth commandment? Honor your father and mother, which was very important to them. And this is not very often that people would essentially give money to the church to get out of taking care of their families. And most Jewish teachers very much rejected this teaching. This was not widespread. This was not common. So why does Jesus zag like this? to help us see that sometimes our traditions actually get in the way of us following well. Sometimes the way that we practice our religion not only confuses us because we think it merits us something, that is, it undefiles us, but also we get so used to practicing it we forget the heart of the command. Jesus' opponents both were guilty of that, and they misperceive defilement, which is not really a cool word, but it's an important word. Yeah, no, that's right. Misperceive, sorry, the opposite of defilement, what Jesus is talking about and what the Pharisees thought they were doing and talking about is holiness. And what this chapter is going to show us through action, the rest of the New Testament explains in more theological terms, is that uh, defilement is real. And cleansing from it is available to us, but only through faith. We'll see that from the next story. 
and cleansing from it is our deepest desire. We long to be right with God, to be undefiled, to be cleansed, to be made righteous and holy by Jesus. That does not come through washing your hands. It does not come through prayer, though prayer is an important activity for followers of Christ. That's why we call what we do religious practices. We long for our minds and hearts to believe and believe ever more deeply in the things of God. But singing this morning has not cleansed you and undefiled you. But if you've received by faith undefilement, singing is so good for your heart and for mine. Religious practice or tradition will not merit anything before God. It cannot undefile us. And worse, believing that religious practice or tradition merits us something will actually lead us towards loopholes in following God. So the first commandment is to worship God and Him alone. If we turn that into, I go to church, and we think that going to church merits something, we're going to miss out on worshiping God, and we're going to believe a lie, and we're going to start to create a loophole for ourselves. If we think that avoiding idolatry is simply not keeping up with the Joneses, your next-door neighbors in terms of cars and gardening or whatever, then we'll create a legalism for ourselves, and we'll miss the guidance away from idolatry towards worshiping God and Him alone, and thereby enjoying the things of the world. If we think that carrying the name of the Lord with honor simply means not cussing, we miss an opportunity to honor him at all times with our mind and with our words. If we think that the fourth commandment simply means not working for money, we're missing God's invitation to feast and to play and to rest. It takes wisdom to uh, follow the fifth commandment to honor father and mother. It's tricky. You want to see my genogram? It's tricky. Someone asked me recently why I talked to a certain family member. I said, because I'm a Christian. I don't talk to them all the time. I don't do everything that they want to do. But the fifth commandment is honor your father and mother. And I like that it's the word honor, which is a little more vague than we might like, but it helps us remember to utilize wisdom in following this commandment. If we think the sixth commandment is simply don't kill the person who cuts you off in traffic, we're not only ignoring Jesus' commands in the Sermon on the Mount, but your words and even your thoughts about neighbor are to be used to encourage and not to tear down. If we think that the seventh commandment only applies to married people not hooking up with other married people, we miss that all of God's commands are big, holistic commands of life to avoid deathly actions and to choose life. Jesus talked about this in the Sermon on the Mount, and he's pushing back on the Pharisees and the scribes because they were doing this, especially with the fifth commandment, and with uh, their traditions regarding washing things. By the way, washing the dishes and hand washing wasn't a bad idea. It was an extension of their call to be a holy people. There's nothing wrong with it, except the way that it was becoming something that people relied upon and thought would undefile them. And then Mark sneaks this in, and by this he declared all things, all foods clean, This is something that took the disciples years to understand. You can read Paul talk about it in Romans 14. You can see the disciples wrestling with it in Acts 10 and 11, and and by extension, chapter 15. The writer of Hebrews in chapter 8 talks about it, and he's quoting Jeremiah, because they had these civil and these ceremonial and dietary laws. And Jesus is beginning to teach them that those laws are fulfilled in him. And the reason that's important is the bad news of verse 22 and 23, which is that if our religious practices can't cleanse us, what can? Only a new heart. The entire Bible tells this story in different language, different genres, different ways of speaking. Jesus talks about it differently than Paul, talks about it differently than Jeremiah, who said the heart is deceitful. What's Jeremiah's answer to that? We need a new heart how bad is it? How bad are we without Jesus? 
This is us naturally without the new heart. Evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness, all those evil things come from within and they defile a person. I believe many of you know this, understand this, it's part of your faith. We are not kind of in need of some religion. We don't need a little bit of help. We don't need a little bit of life coaching or advice. We need a new heart that cleanses us before God because of the work Jesus did and then actually strengthens and enlivens us to a life of life out in the world. Jesus' list reminds me of Harold Ramis in Ghostbusters who picks up a Twinkie and says, imagine this Twinkie is the average amount of psychokinetic activity in New York City. Today's Twinkie is approximately 35 feet long, weighing 600 pounds. The other Ghostbuster says, that's a big Twinkie. This is not a small problem. This is not a small issue. This is not part, but the whole of our need. Is that too fast of a transition from our need is great to a Ghostbusters quote? <laughs> it was a little too fast. Wow, lots. This, this section did not, did not, they weren't ready. They don't dislike Ghostbusters. It's not, I'm not the vibe I'm getting, but they were, <laughs> it was a little quick. Jesus' opponents misperceive holiness, which proceeds from faith, which comes from faith. The gift of faith is a cleansed heart before God. And we then see this lived out in, again, I think one of the most interesting uh, sections of any of the Gospels. If you have your Bible, I'm going to read chapter 7, verses 24 through 30. And listen, listen. If you're listening to this the way that you watch a sitcom or read a novel, you will become uncomfortable. And that's okay. I encourage you to try not to just be like, I'm sure Matt will explain why this is really comfortable. First of all, I'm not going to. Second of all, our faith needs a pulse. It needs to be living and active. It needs to have teeth. And so sometimes the things that will make us uncomfortable will end up encouraging us far more than a sweet poem. I like poetry. Not again, no beef with poetry. But sometimes we need a gritty story to encourage us. Most of us have been through some, some stuff in life, and the discomfort can actually really encourage us. That was a longer intro than I meant to give. Chapter 7, verse 24. And from there he arose, Jesus, and went away to the region of Tyre and Sidon, and he entered a house. And he did not want anyone to know, yet he could not be hidden. But immediately a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him and came down and fell down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile, a Syrophoenician by birth. And she begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. And he said to her, Let the children be fed first, for it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, Yes, Lord. Yet even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. And he said to her, For this statement you may go your way. The demon has left your daughter. And she went home and found the child lying in bed and the demon gone. Try to imagine the first people who heard this story were Jews and Christians, Jewish followers of Christ and Gentile followers of Christ, who had probably known someone who was oppressed by the Phoenician people who enslaved many Christians and Jews. And this is the model of faith? If you find this story uncomfortable, it's because Jesus calls her a dog. Why? A bunch of reasons. One, he wants the people of Israel to come to faith in him and the revelation of God first came to the constituted people of God. So there's an order, starting with Abraham. He's also testing her. 
And if you're wondering if she interpreted it as an insult, here's my answer. Mark doesn't care. He wants us to see how she responds to the testing of her faith. And he's not interested in whether she was offended or not. A lot of pastors will get up in front of you and they'll explain it away. And like, she was probably wealthy and it was a house pet thing, not a mangy dog. And I'm like, it's still a dog. We don't know if she considered it an insult. We know that Jesus is testing her faith. And you that don't find this as interesting as I do, this is the only time in any of the four Gospels that someone wins an argument with Jesus. Did he want her to? Yes, of course, because he was testing her faith. But does she win the argument on technical terms? Yeah. Find me another example in the Gospels. There isn't one. And here's why this is so encouraging, friends. You want hope, and you want it to last and matter in your life, mind and heart. You want the peace of Christ that transcends all understanding. You want guidance in the Lord. Well, here's a gritty, tough story of Jesus testing someone's faith. And that person continued to look at him. And her faith healed her daughter and lasted in her. Your faith is being tested and will be tested. When you get sick, partially understood questions will come out of you and they will test your understanding of God and the world. I don't know what plan you are for your life. J, T, not plan B. People say, I'm on plan B. Who's even on plan B anymore? You didn't expect your life to go the way it's gone. And that tests your faith. That clarifies questions that you either didn't understand or partially understand. I, I think money tests my faith all the time. It was so easy to be generous when I made not very much money and didn't have kids and didn't understand money. It tests my faith to be a little more established and have a little more savings and be a little more terrified for my kids. Like if something happened to me, right? You know what's worse than our suffering in terms of testing our faith is the suffering of a loved one. I think that's worse. It will bring out questions and pain and doubt that you only partially understood. Will we continue to look at Jesus in those moments with all of our emotions? Did we lose James and Peter? They're not showing up on my iPad. Oh, okay. Well, you get to listen to me then. Jesus' half-brother described it this way. Count it all joys, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And this is one of the sweetest parts of the gospel that doesn't feel sweet to learn, but is so encouraging. When your faith is tested and you continue to look at Jesus, you will be matured in faith, which will mean you will have balloons and you will smile and laugh all the time. No, you can have negative emotions and joy at the same time. You can have doubt and continue to look at Jesus and be honest about what it feels like when your faith is tested and continue to trust him. And even continue to be grateful to him. Peter describes it this way. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused, mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation 
of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Listen again to verse 7. I'll slow down. So that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Through Jesus' opponents and through his stories and through this very challenging, brief interaction, we know that faith and life, or uh, cleansing is only possible through him. And then in following him is joy. We know that we will be tested and we will pray and ask the Lord to, continue, to give us the, ability, the, the willingness and ability to, with our minds, like Peter's listeners, we can't see him physically, to continue to look at him with the eyes of faith, with our questions, with a lump in our throat, with all of our emotions, fully expecting that he is going to continue to grow us up in love of him and neighbor. We continue to trust him as our faith is tested. We continue to be grateful with doubts and lumps in our throat and emotions. And we continue to follow because no one else has the words of eternal life or the power to back it up. Let's pray. Jesus, for the men and women in here whose faith is being tested today, would you comfort them? For the men and women that are considering the offer of life, the offer to be cleansed of their sin, would they put their faith and trust in you? And for those of us that are oriented and joyful, would you encourage us that though we may be tested later, today we can glorify and celebrate and praise you. Amen.